What am I worth? Well, I've got a few assets, and to be honest, more than a few debts. Most people say that to calculate your net worth, you should add up those assets and then subtract those debts. But that really doesn't show the whole picture. The thought of having a net worth above zero when you're just starting out, maybe you've got student loans and very little income, might sound ridiculous, and I understand because I'm very young and cool too. But even if you don't have a lot of money to invest, you can still invest in... Wait, is it really that corny? Yeah. You can still invest in yourself. Or to put it better, you can invest in your human capital. With Suzanne Woolley of Bloomberg Wealth, thank you so much for being on Good Money. Can you explain to me what human capital is? Human capital is basically our potential. You may feel, first starting out, that you don't have a lot of money, maybe you have student debt. Um, you feel like you, you're not very rich in assets. Um, but the fact is that, here's another corny line for you, like, you are your biggest asset. <laughs> You have years of earning potential, so you may not have a lot of money in the bank, but your potential at that point is huge. Um, so you're actually rich in that respect, even though you may feel sort of everyday poor. Can you explain to me the ways in which human and financial capital sort of converge as a lifetime goes by? So when you just start out, you have untapped human capital. You have huge earnings potential for decades and decades, but you don't have a lot of financial capital. Going through life, you are building your financial capital. You're also building your human capital. But say at age 55 or so, you may be in your peak earning years. So when you look out down the road, you know, 20, 30 years, your earning potential is not that huge. But by this point, you probably have a lot of financial capital. You've saved in your retirement savings program. Maybe you have other outside savings. So at this point, your financial capital might be a little bit ahead of your human capital, say. Um, and that's pretty much sort of as it should be. So how can I invest in my human capital? What actions can I take to make the most impact? Huh? Your ability to earn an income is one of your greatest assets. Oh, hi. Who are you? I'm Mary Beth Storjahan. I'm a certified financial planner. Oh, well, thanks for coming on the show. How is my career one of my biggest assets? That salary that you're bringing in, the employer benefits, there is so much that can add to your net worth over time, which is why you need to really nurture your career to make sure you're extracting everything you can out of it. What are some steps I can take to nurture my career? The basic ones that we all know about are those promotions, the salary increases, and you know, asking for increased responsibility at your job. The big thing that was misconstrued, especially for young people, is those only come around so often. You can actually drive that process as well. Oftentimes, many people are waiting to be recognized. You're waiting for that annual review. You're waiting for your boss or somebody to recognize your worth or the good things that you're doing. And so the big the biggest thing that we can do as young people is really take your career by the reins and think and make a plan for yourself. You want to communicate with your with your boss and your supervisor to make sure you're clear, number one, on what you can do to advance your position in your role. You can set your own career growth goals and really you can drive that process of meeting with your supervisor. You might not get that raise every quarter, every six months, but you can still have goals and check in to make sure that you're clear of like, or how are you tracking? Are you doing the right things? Are you on track for the raise or the promotion that you are seeking out. And, and you're getting that, that feedback line. That feedback loop does not need to be once a year. The goals don't really work if we're only checking in on them once a year. So beyond those six month check-ins and making sure that I'm on the right track, what else can I do on my own time to build my human capital? So a couple things. One, I like to say focus on education. So you can sign up for online courses covering any topic that you're interested in. So for example, if you're marketing, social media marketing, how to use industry specific software, ways to improve your leadership skills. So there's ways that you can actually round out yourself as a manager and a leader as well. A lot of the times we're focusing just on like on the technical skills, but there's some softer skills that we need as managers and leaders in, in advancing the, the growth ladder. Uh, another 
other one is checking in with your employer on if they, they fund or offer any uh, continuing education opportunities. Will they actually pay for you to go and take any of those um, classes or courses to advance yourself is another one. And then um, certifications. So depending on your industry, there's I'm sure a variety of designations or specialties or certifications that you can get and you can seek those out on your own. So what if I feel stuck, like I'm at a dead end in my current job? If you're feeling stuck in your current position at work, one of the things that I usually say is go back and, and take stock of like, what are your career growth goals? Are you in an industry that you enjoy? Is it something that you want to continue to pursue? And I think the biggest thing is don't be afraid to, to jump. If you want to go in for one last push, I like to say build a career um, reverse bucket list. What are all of the things that you've accomplished in your job that you're currently in? If you want to go in for one last push or, or kind of like conversation around negotiating or growth. Uh, and if it doesn't work out, look for another job. If you're, if you're feeling stuck, nobody says you have to stay. Thanks so much, Mary Beth, for stopping by. So hypothetically, I get to the point in my career where I can start investing some actual financial capital. But how should I invest that based on the type of career that I have? William Bernstein, Bill, thank you so much for joining us on Good Money. Um, could you just really quickly introduce yourself and say what it is that you do? Uh, I'm a recovering neurologist. Uh, I haven't practiced for 15 years. I write about uh, finance. I write about uh, economic uh, and technological uh, history. Uh, I do have an investment advisory firm that I uh, co-founded uh, with a lady named Susan Sharon, Efficient Frontier Advisors. Uh, and uh, that's uh, it in a nutshell, I guess. Let me ask you, based on their careers, what should people be thinking about how they should invest their money? And you have to ask yourself, is your job uh, a, um, uh, a bond or is it a stock or a lottery ticket? How risky is your human capital? And so if your human capital is not very risky, if you're that tenured professor uh, or a government employee, you can afford to take lots of stock market risk. But if you're working in the financial services industry, uh, you're already invested. Your job is already invested in the stock market. So maybe you want to take a lot less risk in your investment portfolio. If you look at your total capital, okay, your investment capital plus your your human capital, uh, when you're very young, the the your 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 human capital overwhelms your investment capital. So there's nothing wrong with taking a lot of risk, particularly if you have a relatively secure job. So if you have a job that's a bond, you have a nice secure teaching position or government position or a reasonably secure job in your industry with good employment prospects no matter where you are, uh, then essentially you have a lot of bond capital in, in your, in your, on the human side. So there's no reason why you can't go whole hog and invest all of your investment capital when you're young in stocks. And at least the theory says that's what you should do. The problem with that comes on the emotional side, which is there are very few people, you know, there are very few sentient beings in this quadrant of the galaxy that can tolerate an all-stock portfolio when they're 25 years old. Let's say that you have a, a more freewheeling career. Um, what kind of safe things should be, you be putting your money in? The classic riskless asset uh, right, is, is of course a T-bill. Has no, it's perfectly reasonably safe. The government can always print money uh, to, to pay you to pay you back. There's no, there's no credit risk uh, or almost no credit risk. And there's almost no duration risk uh, either. In terms of the last few decades, what has changed about what jobs are bonds, stocks, and 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 has that gotten worse or better? I suppose. Oh, much worse. Uh, you know, um, we're 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 living we're living in libertarian heaven uh, right now, where no one has you know fewer and fewer people have have job security. I mean, you're a journalist. I don't have to tell you about that. So there are far fewer bond-like jobs out there and a whole lot of jobs that are more like really bad lottery tickets. Yikes, so maybe my career is more of a lottery ticket. I hope it hits. <laughs>